Amen. Hosea chapter number nine. So we're going to go through this chapter tonight, but tonight I want to show you, um, so you chess guys are going to like this uh, tonight, so I'm going to show you some game theory in the Bible tonight, all right? So we're going to go through um, Hosea chapter number nine, and then I want to kind of go through this verse by verse, um, kind, of, uh, kind of zip over it, but I want to point out um, a main theme in this chapter, all right? I want to point out this main theme in this chapter, and then we'll study that and I'll give you some examples um, throughout history, and I'll, I'll show you how we can apply that um, to our lives. So we're going to look at game theory in the Bible, okay? So if you think about strategy and different things when you're playing chess, or, you know, you should have strategy in your life, too. Did you know that? But you should have, you should think about the things that you're doing in your life and why you're doing them um, according to what's going on around you. And so you can make smart, wise decisions, all right? Look down at Hosea chapter number 9. So Hosea chapter number 9 is just dealing out more punishment, more consequences on Israel or Ephraim as it is related to here. But there's a theme here that comes up five times. And I want you to, if you write in your Bible, you can make note of these. I have, you know, one through five noted in my Hosea chapter number 9. There's a main theme here. Look down at verse number one, and we'll take a look at what this is. The Bible says, Rejoice not, O Israel, for joy as other people. For thou hast gone a whoring from thy God, and thou hast loved reward upon every corn floor. So here, of course, he's saying, you know, you've betrayed me. We saw the, you know, the first couple chapters of Hosea, um, how God compared Israel to, you know, whoredom and a prostitute that literally went and became an adulteress um, to her husband. That's the, the example he's giving, he's bringing up again. Verse 2, the floor and the wine press shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail in her. Saying, and this is kind of another theme that comes up over here, is like nothing that they do, nothing that they try to produce is going to help. God is just saying that, you know, there's punishment coming, there's bad times coming, and nothing is going to save you from this. Now look at verse number 3. This is Point one of the, the theme that I want to show you tonight in the first part, right before the semicolon, where it says, They shall not dwell in the Lord's land. They shall not dwell in the Lord's land. But Ephraim shall return to Egypt, and they shall eat unclean things in Assyria. So here we see that they're going to be taken out of the land. All right, they're going to be taken out of from where they are. And of course, we know that the main invasion was the Assyrian Empire coming in and wiping out the northern kingdom of Israel. Look at verse number four. They shall not offer wine offerings to the Lord, neither shall they be pleasing unto him. Their sacrifices shall be unto them as the bread of mourners. All that eat thereof shall be polluted, for their bread for their soul shall not come into the house of the Lord. God just saying, you're done. Your sacrifices will be no good. Verse five, what will you do in the solemn day and in the day of the feast of the Lord? For lo, they are gone because of destruction. Egypt shall gather them up, Memphis shall bury them. Again, Memphis is a city in Egypt saying that they're just going to be scattered um, to the wind. I'll show you that in other parts of the Bible as well. The pleasant places for their silver, nettles shall possess them, thorns shall be in their tabernacles. It's saying they're going to be, they're not going to be there. Everything is going to be overgrown. Everything is going to be done. They're going to be taken off. They're going to be destroyed by foreign nations. Look at verse number seven. The days of visitation are come. The days of recompense are come. Israel shall know it. The prophet is a fool. The spiritual man is mad. Saying, the prophet is a fool. That, I mean, not Hosea, but the prophets aren't telling them the truth. The prophets, we saw this in earlier chapters of the Bible. The prophets are telling them what they want to hear. They're not, you know, they're, they're along with the kings and the princes that have turned on God. The spiritual man is mad. For the multitude of thine iniquity and the great hatred. The watchman of Ephraim was with my God, but the prophet is a snare, is a snare of a fowler in all his ways. So he's saying that a true watchman is with God, but the prophet that's in that's in Ephraim now is a snare of a fowler, meaning it's a it's a trap, basically, is what he's saying. A fowler is somebody. That, um, that hunts birds, right? So he's saying, you know, if you ever, has anyone ever used the snare before other than me? All right, but anyway, you can catch animals and you can catch birds 
um, with a snare. It's a, just a little piece of, of string or whatever, and when something you know, steps into it, you just snare it and it grabs its legs. Verse number nine. They have deeply corrupted themselves as in the days of Gibeah. Therefore, will I remember their iniquity, he will visit their sins. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. There's just an interesting um, dichotomy here in the Bible. So he's saying here that this nation is getting judged, and he's getting judged, this nation. This nation, God is going to remember their sins. That's why they're getting judged. All right? You know, compare that to us in salvation through Jesus Christ in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 17, where God literally says that because of the sacrifice of Jesus, this shows you the difference between judgment of nations and salvation of individuals right here. All right. So nations are judged on this earth. Every nation will be judged on this earth. And that's what's happening to the northern kingdom of Israel. But individual salvation through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that one sacrifice that is, you know, forever is, you know, in verse number 17, it's explained, their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where the remission of these is, there is no more offering for sins. So that's the remission of our sins, not, you know, the forgiveness. Forgiveness is our relationship with God. Remission is what Jesus Christ granted us where God the Father will look at us and he will see the righteousness of Christ clothing us and he will not see our sins, is what he is saying, you know, through that. Versus what he's saying to this nation right now, he's like, no, I'm coming to bring all this judgment on you, all these terrible things that I'm about to read to you. And why? Because I remember all your sin. That's why. All right. So that's a, just a, a great contrast to individual salvation. Look at verse number 10. He says, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as first stripe in the fig tree at her first time. So he's saying here, he's saying, you used to be good. You know, we talk about fathers, you know, the, the generations previous before they turned, you know, in the wilderness. He's literally talking about when they were in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first stripe in the fig tree at her first time. But, so he's saying, you used to be good. Previous generations used to be good, but they went to Baal Peor. You know, this is Satan, Baal, um, you know, the, this, you know, false gods, basically, and separated themselves unto that shame, and their abominations were according as they loved. As for Ephraim, their glory shall fly away like a bird from the birth, from the womb, and from the conception. Though they bring up their children, yet will I bereave them that there shall not be a man left, yea, woe also to them when I depart from them. So again, talking about there shall not be a man left, but look at verse 13. This is point two. Ephraim, as I saw Tyrus, you know, Tyrus is on the coast in this great place, is planted in a pleasant place. That's point number two. But Ephraim shall bring forth his children to the murderer. So again, we see a reference to where they are right now. It's saying there's a reference to where they are. They're in a pleasant place. And the first reference that I listed to you was, they shall not dwell in the Lord's land. The Lord's land is the promised land, is where God brought them. So we see a reference again in verse number 13 to where they are now. All right, where they are now. But Ephraim shall bring forth his children to the murderer. Again, talking about that judgment that is coming um, to this nation. Look at verse 14. Give them, O Lord, what will thou give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breast, saying, you know, you're not going to be um, multiplying anymore. All their wickedness is in Gilgal, for there I hated them for the wickedness of their doings. Look at this again. Here's point number three, or reference number three. I will drive them out of mine house. I will love them no more. All their princes are revolters. Look at verse number 16. So that's the third reference. That's the third reference in this chapter, this short trap chapter, about how they are in the right place right now, but they're not going to be there anymore. All right? So part of this, like, there's a lot of judgments here. There's a lot of things that God is saying, but this theme that keeps coming up again and again, three times we've seen it so far, is that they're in the right place now, but they're not going to be there anymore when this judgment comes. Look at verse 16. Ephraim is smitten, defeated, destroyed. Their root is dried up. They shall bear no fruit. 
Yea, though they bring forth, yet will I slay even the beloved fruit of their womb. Now this is, I believe this is a reference to like the actual Assyrian takeover right here. I mean, the Bible gets pretty graphic about what happens in that Assyrian um, empire takeover. You can even read secular history about what the Assyrians did to um, their captors and things like that. Um, but basically, they did not have, mer- I'll just put it this way um, to keep it family friendly, they did not have mercy even on pregnant women. Let's put it that way, all right? Look at verse number 17. My God, again, here's, here's fourth reference right here. My God will cast them away. Again, taking them out of where they are to someplace else because they did not hearken unto him. And here's reference number five. And they shall be wanderers among the nations. So here we see this theme that I've showed you five different places that in, you know, there's lots of judgments here in Hosea chapter number nine, but we see this main theme of continued punishment throughout the whole chapter, but literally This repeating theme in chapter number nine here is saying Israel will be removed from their place. And that's exactly what happened to the northern kingdom of Israel. Look, that is a different judgment than what happened to Judah. Judah was taken into captivity and then, look, and some people even stayed in Judah when the Babylonian captivity, you know, some people were taken in these waves of captivity But then after 70 years, they came back. This is a different judgment. And this is very clear here that is just talking about that they will be removed from this place. But look, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 28. I'm just going to give you one reference in the Bible. There's many references of this in the Bible. But go to Deuteronomy chapter number 28. And let me just say this. This was always the deal with God. When they went into the promised land, this was always the deal. Look at Deuteronomy chapter number 28. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but Deuteronomy chapter number 28 is basically starting out. It starts out and it says, here's all the good things that will happen if you listen to me. Now that they're in the promised land, now that they're in the place that they should be. All right. So Moses and Joshua and all the, you know, their fathers warned them about this. And in verse number one through basically, you know, just the first few verses are all the good things. And then the rest of the chapter is all the curses that will happen if they don't listen. All right. Look at verse number one. It says, it shall come to pass, Deuteronomy 28. If thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and do all his commandments, which I commanded thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. He's talking to the nation here. He's not talking to an individual person saying you have to become perfect to go to heaven. This is a direction for the people, the nation, all right? And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, and thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. So you see here that it's a contract. It's a covenant. It, these things will happen to you if, if you're a computer programmer, it's like an if-then statement. It's like if you do this, then this will happen, Okay. But or, or look down at verse number 60. I mean, there's much more of the chapter that covers what will happen if they don't listen than there is that will, you know, because it's basically like God will just increase you and just bless you. But if you don't, so it just shows you how, how, how diligent God was warning the nation, how diligent the fathers, Moses was warning the nation. Look at verse 60. I'll just give you a few here, but I want to show you some verses here that match up with Hosea chapter number nine. Moreover, look at verse number 60. Now we're not talking about, now we're talking about what happens if they don't listen. He will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt. Notice Egypt there again, which thou was afraid of, and they shall cleave unto thee. Also every sickness and every plague, which is not written in the book of this law, then will the Lord bring upon thee until thou be destroyed. Again, just you're going to be cursed. You're not going to be blessed. And you should be left. Look, here's the theme that we see in Hosea chapter nine right here. You should be left few in number. You will not be multiplying. You will not be fruitful. Whereas you were as the stars of heaven for multitude, because thou wouldest not obey the voice of the Lord God. You're seeing the, the connection here. You're seeing the, the similar um, judgments here, the similar warning versus what's actually going to happen to them. Look at verse 63. Now we see the same theme come up that we saw in Hosea chapter 9 five times. And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do good and to multiply you, 
So the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you. That's not a good place when the Lord is literally rejoicing over you to destroy you and bring you to naught. And what? Look at this. Ye shall be plucked from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. So Moses is literally warning the people. God is warning the people before they even get into the land to possess it. He's like, if you don't follow the command of God, like you're going to be plucked off of it. And what we're seeing is that come to pass in Hosea chapter number 9. Look at verse 64. And the Lord, again, seeing the same thing come to pass, the Lord shall scatter thee among all the people, from one end of the earth even unto the other, and there, shall, and there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations shall thou find no ease, neither shall be the sole of thy foot have rest, but the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart, and failing of eyes, and sorrow of mind. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and thou shalt have none assurance of thy life. In the morning thou shalt say, Would God it were even. It's saying, like, you won't even want to wake up in the morning. I mean, you'll hear people say this that are, like, super depressed, like they don't even want to get out of bed. You ever heard people say that? Like, somebody's really depressed. They're like, I'm so depressed. I just don't want to get out of bed. That's what he's talking about. You're going to be like that all the time. He's like, it's going to be so horrible for you that you'll just like, you'll wake up and you'll just want the day to be immediately over and you'll just want to go to sleep again. So the point of the sermon and the title of the sermon tonight is this. It's your place, your place. We see the nation of Israel was in the place that they were supposed to be. So let's apply that to ourselves tonight. Let's look at our place. Where are we supposed to be in our lives? How do we know where we're supposed to be? How do we get there? And then there's another question after that that I, I don't want to give it away for you. But turn to Proverbs chapter 29. Turn to Proverbs chapter 29. So we see that the place that God wants us is pretty important in the Bible. All right? Because that was the whole deal with the children of Israel is if you listen to me, I'll keep you in this place. If you don't, I'm going to remove you out of this place, okay? Now, the first thing that we need to do is we need to find our place. We need to find our place. Now, look at Proverbs chapter number 29. Look at verse number 18. Proverbs 29, verse number 18. The Bible says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. So look, two-thirds of people or the majority of people are going to fail to find their place in the first place. In, you know, probably, probably over 90% of people in this world, if we just consider even the unsaved, are, are just going to not find their place at all in this life. You say, what are you talking about? I mean, look, they don't know. <laughs> they don't know where their place is, nor have they thought of where their place should be. This is the vast majority of people. But it should not, it should not be us. I mean, just think about you know, your life as a Christian. Just think about, you know, just life in general. I mean, what should I be doing with my life? This is your place. And the Bible is saying, if you don't have a vision for that, you know, the people perish. The people that don't have a vision of where they should be will perish. Where do you get it? Well, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. You get it from the Bible. You get your place. You find out where your place should be from the Word of God. I mean, in all aspects, in all aspects. I mean, should I be married? What should I, what should I do for a career? You know, all these different things, you know, the answer can be found in the Bible. How should I, how should I serve, should I serve God with my life? What kind, I mean, what kind of church should, should I go to? Should I go to church? Not all these visions of where you should be in your life are found in the Bible. And most people will never even find out where they should be in this life. We're not even talking about being in that place yet. We're talking about knowing where they should be. So the first thing you have to do is you have to know where you should be, and the only way you're going to know that is through the Bible. That's the only way you're going to have that proper vision. But 
If you're one of those few people that knows where you should be in your life, and this works down to every last detail of your life, by the way, every last minute detail of your life, you should have a biblical vision for that detail of where you should be. But then, you know, you're not there yet. Now you know where you need to go. Now you need to get there. Now you need to get to that place. So the question is, how are you going to get there? Look, we're not even to the sermon yet. We're just talking about knowing where you should go and then getting to that place. See, because a lot of people, a lot of Christians that even know the Bible know where they should go, but then they just expect things to happen. They just expect things to fall into their lap. They just expect, they just don't know how to achieve anything is the issue that they have. I mean, you have to think about all these different things in your life. I mean, uh, you know, a, a marriage. How are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? How are you going to achieve that? A career. But they can't get on a path and follow that path. Most people, as I've preached before, most people overthink what they should do for a living. You don't have to be an astronaut and colonize Mars. You have to make a living and support your family. That's what you have to do. You have to make just gain. Church. Church. How do, how do I, most people, most Christians know, if they're reading the Bible, they know that they should be in church. And look, even though it's getting harder and harder to find a good church, most people know where one is. And how do I get there? Well, the answer is you just have to achieve it. You just have to go. You just have to go. It takes following the Bible takes doing, not thinking about it, not wanting something. It, it, it takes being able to execute outside your comfort zone because the devil wants to keep you in your comfort zone. And we'll get to that in just a second. But let's get back to the vision. The vision. Proverbs 29. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Where does the vision come from? The vision comes from the Bible. Here's a problem. If you don't know, if you don't have a vision in where you are going, not only will you never get there, you will never even know if you, if you are there or if you are close to it. And more importantly, don't forget this. This is, this is where we're going to start talking about some strategy here. All right? If you don't have a biblical vision for where you should be, listen carefully. You will not know if you are in the incorrect place. And look, being in the incorrect place, but thinking it's the correct place, is a disaster for you. As a matter of fact, being in the incorrect place and thinking it's the correct place is a disaster for anybody. I'm going to give you some Civil War examples to demonstrate this tonight. I'm going to, kids, listen up. I'm going to explain the Civil War to you. The Civil War was from 1861 to 1865, about four years long. Let me give you an example of a disaster a disaster of somebody that thought that they were in the right place. They were in an incorrect place. I'll give you just a real world example. Somebody that was in the incorrect place, they thought it was the right place, and it's disaster. If you don't have a biblical vision, I'm trying to demonstrate to you tonight, if you don't have a biblical vision on where you should be, you will not know if you're in the wrong place. In 1863, so Robert E. Lee, the commander of the Confederate Army, he invaded the North twice. He invaded Northern Territory during that four years of the Civil War. He invaded the North twice. You say, why did he do that? I'm going to explain that to you in just a few minutes. But the second invasion was in 1863. He invaded Pennsylvania and he found himself facing the Army of the Potomac at a place called Gettysburg. Very famous uh, place. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. But for him, this was not the right place. But he thought it was. He thought he was in the right place. But he was not in the right place. Even though some tried to tell him that he was in the wrong place, 
He had pride vision, and he wouldn't listen to anybody. And he thought that that was his place. He was in. He was where he should be. So the point is, your vision must come from the law, showing you clearly where you should be. That way you will know when you are where you shouldn't be. That's the first point. Now, here's, here's the, let's go back to your place. We'll go back to the Civil War in just a few minutes. But he found himself, just remember that he found himself in a place that it was not his place, but he thought it was. Now, let's go back to your place. So we know that you need to know where your place is, and you need to find a way to get to your place. You say, okay, I know where my place is, and I got to it. Now what? Well, here's the point of the whole sermon. You need to figure out a way to stay there. You need to figure out a way to stay in that place. This is Israel's problem right now in Hosea chapter number 9. Look, you know where it is. You know how to get there. You got there. Time to relax, right? Nope. Turn to 1 Peter chapter number 5. Turn to 1 Peter chapter number 5. Now you have to find a way to stay there now that you have found where you should be. This was the warning from Moses. This was the warning from Joshua. He said, you did it. You were in the wilderness for 40 years. You went into the promised land and you fought all these battles. But you need to find a way to stay there. You need to find a way to dwell there for generations. Think about it. All the wars, all the decades wandering in the wilderness, being in the right place. Look, it's about remaining in the right place. Because think about all the work that goes into knowing where to go and then getting there just to get there and then be there for a, a decade or a year or a week or whatever. No, you need to stay there. And guess what? The devil in your Christian life, Satan himself will try to get you to leave once you're in the right place. Look at 1 Peter chapter number 5, verse number 8. The Bible says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Here's a way of, of, of saying that a different way. The devil's against you being in that place. Once you have the vision from the Bible, you've You've identified the place. You've figured out a way to get there through diligence and hard work. And you've gotten there. You've gotten there with your family. You've gotten your wife there. You've gotten your children there. You're where you are supposed to be. The devil's against you. He's trying to get you out of that place. He's against you being there in that church. He's against you being in that marriage. He's against you raising those children to have their vision of where they should be in their lives. He's against it. He's against all of it. So what does he do? He tempts you. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. But God gives us two promises that if we are in the right place, he promises us two things, that we will be able to stay there. He gives us these two specific promises. Look at verse 13 of 1 Corinthians Chapter number 10. We're talking about getting to the right place and being able to remain in that place. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, look at verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as common to man. So first of all, God says this. He's like, nothing's going to come at you that's brand new. There's not going to be anything that comes at you that other, that hasn't, and not only that hasn't happened to another man before, but that's common to man. He's saying, There's nothing, the the devil is not original. He doesn't have like all these new inventions and all these different, you know, methodologies of things. He uses the same tactics every single time. And that's what God is telling us. He's saying Satan is generally stupid. He's unoriginal and he just does the same moves every single time. How would you play chess against somebody that just, like, I play chess with one of these guys that's, like, one of the best players in the church now, and I beat him with the little three-move thing, like, a year ago. But do you think if I just did that every single time, I would just beat him every single time? No. But Satan uses the same three moves 
is what God is telling us. It's the same, you know, three or four move opening every single time, yet people still fall for it. Why is that? So he's saying, recognize things that are common, temptations that are common. It's not hard to identify these things. But then look at this. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. But he will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. He's saying, he's saying you will be able, if you stay where you are supposed to be, you will be able to withstand it. That's what he's saying. Let's go back to the battle, should we? See, Satan tries to entice you out of that marriage. He throws things in your way. What does he throw? Are they new things? Are they new things to get you out of that marriage? What does he throw? He throws things like, you know, um, infidelity and temptation your way. Is that new? It's not new. Even, even David got taken down by that. It's common to man. He throws things like pornography at you. He throws all these things at your marriage to try to get you out of your marriage. You should be, that's the place you should be in that godly marriage. But Satan's going to throw all these things at you. But God is saying, if you stay in your place, you will be able to withstand it. Here's another one. He throws, maybe he throws a friend at you that's, that's just like, that's been divorced and is just anti. You know, you know what? The Bible says, I think it's Proverbs 13. It says, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise. But what does it say? He that, that goeth with fools, you know, will be destroyed, basically. I, I misquoted that, but you see what I'm saying. Did you know, did you know that l l there's literal statistics, like secular statistics, that say that if you have a friend that's been divorced, if you are hanging around a close friend that has been divorced, you have a 75% greater chance of being divorced yourself. That's, that's one degree. Now, I've thought about this a lot lately, too. But that's one degree of separation. You have, like, that's a close friend of yours. But if you even have a friend of a friend that has been divorced, you still have a 33% chance. These are secular studies. Look, you should not be hanging around people that are divorced if you're married. That's what that tells me. Of course, the Bible told me that in Proverbs 13. I shouldn't be... I, look, that's, all, that's what separation's about right there, is separating from fools. Because sin is contagious. And I mean, haven't you seen it just in this world if you're over 30? Haven't you seen the, the woman at work or the man at work? Both. I've seen it both ways where they're just complaining about their wife or complaining about their husband or just, you know, down on marriage because they've been through one or two marriages or whatever. I mean, if you just listen to that, you know, all day long, every single day, that will affect you. But that's Satan using something that is common to man to get you out of the place that you are supposed to be. I mean, he's, trying to, he's going to try to stop you from going to or staying in a good church. He tries to inject doubt into you, into your, your Christian life. All to what? To get you to voluntarily leave where you are supposed to be. See, the key to staying, the key to staying is you are where you should be, have the experience to be patient, and then God says, but he, you know, he will make a way to escape in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. So what God is telling you in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, the last part of that verse, is if you're in the right place, if you're on that ground that you should be, you have the advantage. Let's go back to the Civil War. Back to Gettysburg. See, well, let's just, let me just answer the whole Civil War for the kids here. Okay? Here's the answer of the whole Civil War right here. The North, from the beginning of the Civil War, from the first shot fired, the North was in a better place. They just were. They were in a better place. Why? They had more manpower, and they had much more industrial strength. It's that simple. And that's, that's the one part of the lost cause theory that is actually correct, the, the one part, if you know what that is, but I won't get into that. But the point is, they had more manpower and they had more industrial strength. There's 22 million people, give or take, in the north, and there was 9 million people in the south. The south was agrarian. They didn't have the factories and the steel and all the, the mills and all these different things. 
and the North was industrial. They had factories and they, had, they could produce materials and they could produce men and, I mean, that's what it comes down to. Look, if you're playing chess, guys, if you're playing chess and you've got seven pieces left and the other guy has, you know, 10 pieces left, you can't trade piece for piece. You can't go bishop for bishop or even bishop for knight or whatever. You can't do it. You're, it's a losing, it's a losing proposition. So Lee had to invade. That's why he invaded. I'm not saying he was wrong for invading. He had, he was for, see, he was forced out of his place. He had to get asymmetric about it. He couldn't just go and, and trade soldier for soldier. He had to go up north. He tried to, had to, he had to demoralize the north. He had to try to remove their political will to fight. He had to try to win some asymmetric vic victories in order to have a chance. He knew this, and that's why he invaded. But, I mean, if he didn't, they could just, the North could just sit back, rearm, refit, reman, and they could just strike at will whenever they wanted. He could not allow that to happen. Trading blows was not going to work for the South. So he had to invade. Let's go back to Gettysburg. More specifically, Lee found himself in a position at Gettysburg. He had about 70,000 soldiers. The Union had about 90,000 soldiers. But that wasn't really the, the deciding factor. Meade's Army of the Potomac was in the right place. They were in the hills surrounding this lowlands where Lee's army was. They literally had... They literally had the best ground to fight from. Why in the world, since they had the best ground, why in the world would they go down to fight? And they didn't. They didn't go down to fight. They didn't have to. And applying that to our sermon tonight, let me just say this. If you have the vision and you know where you are supposed to be in your life, you know the place, and then you went to that place, and you are now standing in that place. Don't miss this. When you have the moral high ground in your life, you don't need to fight. When you know you're on the right side, in the right place, people will come, they'll have to come fight you. You don't have to, and the answer, the answer is, let them come. If you have the moral high ground, if you have that biblical vision of where you are supposed to be, let them come. So what did the Union do? They sat on the hills. They sat on the ridge. And Lee, on the third day of the, the bloodiest battle in American history, he marched his army across over a mile of open ground under heavy cannon fire and eventually musket fire. They had to crawl over a fence, crawl over a rock wall. By the time they got to the Union position that was heavily fortified in the right place, they had suffered 50% casualties. And Meade, Meade, this was the famous Pickett's Charge. And Meade was so smart. The commanding Union general was so smart that even after he had successfully defeated these 12,000 men that marched across this field, he would not send the Union soldiers back down into the same field that the Confederates came from to chase them. And you know the reason why? He's like, I'm in the right place. Why would I leave? Why would I put myself in the same position that Lee just put his army in? Where cannons can reach us and gunfire from the trees can reach us. He's like, I'm in the right place. So what's the lesson? If you're in the right spot, stay there. That's the lesson. If you're in the right spot, you can't be defeated. That's what God is saying in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. The enemy will come to you, but you will be able to win if you stay where you are supposed to be. You see... Israel was in the right spot. But then they turned on God. They turned to false gods. They, they turned to wickedness. 
Hosea chapter 9, Deuteronomy chapter number 28, basically says God will remove them if they do this, is what God warned, you know, hundreds of years before they even found themselves in this position where they're about to be judged or they're being warned of this coming judgment in Hosea chapter number 9. But really, they had the strength to resist it all because they were in the right spot already. They had given all, been given all the tools from their fathers, all the warnings from their fathers. They were in the right spot. So really when it comes down to it, they removed themselves. We have, in our Christian lives, we have the support to stay in the right place. We have the vision to know where it is. We have the diligence to get there, and we have the support to stay. God is saying, you can resist the devil. If you get in that church, get in that Christian life, get in that, you know, that discipleship that you're supposed to be in in your life, you can do it. We have the power to remain where God wants us once we are there. This goes for everything. This goes for your goals in your life. This goes for the goals for your children, for your wife, for your marriage. But the bottom line is, if we decide to come out of the hills and go down into the valley, go down into Egypt or go down wherever other people are, even to go down to, to fight, why would you ever do that when you have the good ground and you are where you are supposed to be. There's no reason for it. Absolutely no reason at all. If we come out of the hills in our Christian life, it's not because God didn't give us something that we needed. It's because we removed ourselves. That's the lesson here. That's the game theory using this example of the Civil War, applying it to Hosea chapter 9 and applying it to our lives. Just be smart. I mean, you don't even really have to be that smart. You just have to listen to what the Bible is warning us about. Don't remove ourselves. We have it. We know where it is. We're there. Just, we have the power to resist. It won't last forever. If you're under some kind of temptation, God says, he'll make a way. I mean, do you think that's a joke when God says, like, you know, I'll make a way for you to escape? Maybe, maybe look for that way to escape instead of looking for a path down the hill. That's the problem. That's why Christians get in situations where they fall to something stupid that's been common to man because they weren't looking for the escape route that was right there. They were looking at the, at the path down the hill to the valley to get mixed up in some brawl or get mixed up in some sin or get you know, mixed up in something that's going to make them leave where they are. Stay where you are. Because if we come out of the hills, it was us that took ourselves out. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.